Well, good morning, church. It's good to worship with you this morning. Uh, in the way of announcements, I uh, just want to uh, remind everyone that Saturday night, uh, 5.30, uh, at the Poker House, um, it will be another potluck. We had one a few weeks ago. It was boiling hot. This should be a little, little better on Saturday night. But if you want, bring a chair. If you want, bring a dish. There'll be plenty of food, good fellowship. Circle will be gathered together, and everybody will be sharing all the stuff that goes on uh, in their own lives. So we encourage you to do that. We'll provide the meat and the tableware and the water and all of that other stuff. You just come, all right? So be be good to have you with us. Anything else that needs to be announced this morning? The theme for our worship this morning is about living out our faith in a special way living it out that brings honor and glory to Christ. So the God who calls us to live out faith, not just believe, but to live out what we believe, calls us here to worship this morning. That God awaits our praise. That God longs to speak to our hearts. And so I say to you, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Today we join with generations of faithful believers in offering ourselves to God through the words of the psalmist. Today's reading is from Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. One generation shall command your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness.
All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, for all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Continuing on with the call to confession, our Lord God seeks us out to bring healing to our fears and failures. He knows our weaknesses. He understands our frailty. Let us call upon the one who lives to make intercession for us and restore us into full favor with God. Let us pray together. There are many times we think we love you well, O God, but upon hearing your call to love you, with all our heart and all our mind and all our strength, we confess that our love of you is a deluded love, often lukewarm and offered from a divided heart. We have been unfaithful to our covenant with you and with one another and chased after other gods of money, power, greed, and convenience. We confess the poverty of our worship, the neglect of fellowship, and the absence of charity. We acknowledge a half-hearted witness for Christ and a lukewarm response to your call to serve others with the love of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us take a few moments now and have a silent confession to our Lord. Let this be the, of God's pardon and abundant grace. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. And by his wounds you have been healed. Know that in Christ Jesus your sins are forgiven. Let's take a few moments now and pass God's peace to each other. Would you bow your, your heads and let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of Scripture, words that were designed to impart to us your desire and your will, words that were crafted by those who wrote them, who saw something of you that put together tell of your story, tell us of your heart. Help us to hear that heart this morning. Help us to hear your words. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand that which you have for us today. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we start a new book. We're going to spend the next five weeks in the book of James. Um, 
And so our passage this morning, we're going we're gonna to begin in chapter 1, but we're going to begin in the latter part of it in verse 16. It says these words. Know this, my beloved brothers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers, for every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he has brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be the first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers, ever, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of humans does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a person who looks intently at, the, at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks that they are religious and does not bridle their tongue but deceives their heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. This is the word of the Lord. Well, as I said to you, we're beginning a brand new book, the book of James. It is an interesting book. Those of us who study the scriptures it has been a controversial book over the years. It took a long time for the book of James to find its way into the official canon of the scripture. It was kind of looked at with some sort of suspicion. And really all the way up to the 16th century and Martin Luther who thought that the book was just nothing but a whole bunch of straw that had no nutritional value. It was debated, should it or shouldn't it be part of the scripture? because it challenges us. The epistle of James is to the New Testament what the book of Proverbs is to the Old Testament. All right, so it is a New Testament version of the book of Proverbs. And therefore it is written in a way that has a whole bunch of like axioms, a whole bunch of like principles that speak to us. James, the author of this book, is the half-brother to Jesus. So he is, the, he is the son of Joseph and Mary. So he would have grown up in the household of Jesus. He was never one of the official disciples or apostles. In fact, in the gospel stories, you'll see him and his brothers and sisters and Mary sometimes chiding Jesus for who he thinks he is. But at some point in James' life, he undergoes a transformation and he understands that his brother, or his half-brother in this case, theologically, he sees him as being the Messiah and he is converted. And so not only now is he this brother of Jesus, but he is also the chief head of the church at Jerusalem. And in his day, he's probably one of the most respected leaders in the church. He was beloved in the church. He was a strong leader. He was someone who not only held the Jewish community together within Jerusalem, the believers in Christ there, but also had the vision to incorporate the gospel out into the world of the Gentiles. It's interesting that the brother of Jesus doesn't tell us stories about Jesus growing up. He doesn't tell us really anything about Jesus. In fact, the word Jesus only appears twice in the whole epistle. James is interested in doing something else with us. There's no reference really to Jesus. There's no reference to the cross or the resurrection. There is no concern for any theology really. 
the things that we build all of our creeds and our confessions on when we recite them, all of the things that we normally think are central to our faith. What do you believe? How do you believe it? You know, and all of those nuances that we fight over in the church over is this correct and how much attention do you give this and what does this over here mean? James doesn't have anything to do with any of that. He's not interested in the theory of the faith. He's not interested in the mechanics of the faith. He's not really interested in telling us how that we are to be saved or how our, friend, our, our sins are forgiven or how all of this is affected overall and what God intends to do with salvation. The only theology that is in the book of James is the first 17 verses, most of which we omitted this morning because that's not what James is about. He introduces theology because he is writing to a group of dispersed Jewish believers that have been scattered about, who are encountering significant trials in their faith. They are under, undergoing immense tribulation, and he wants them to know that their temptations, their trials, their tests, the things that they are to endure in the faith, they're not from God. That God is good, and that is his theology. God is good. Let no man say when he is tempted that he is tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted of evil, neither does he tempt anyone with evil. That's James' whole thing. But every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of light in whom there is no variable changing that goes on. God is good. That sums up James' theology. What James is concerned about is how we live. He wants to know, what does the life of faith look like? All the others have taught you about all the belief mechanics, and I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and all of the things with that, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, and I believe in the church, and I believe in the resurrection of the dead. James lets other people do that. And he just simply goes after what is your life supposed to look like? And therefore, he has some valid things to say to us. How do we display the integrity of the life that Jesus calls us to? How are we to be identified as Christians? Or what are those identity markers that we possess? That's James' chief concerns. Most of our faith discussion involves justification, how we become into a right relationship with God. That's, that's what permeates most of the faith landscape. Or God's grace and how that brings about salvation. James is concerned about the reality of that in our lives. So James presents an idea rather than a Christ-based redemption, James is talking about a Christ-centered living. Rather than talking about focus on a Sunday morning worship service, James is focused on what we do Monday through Saturday. There's a vast difference there. Maybe that's why James is so unpopular, because he kind of cuts through the chase and begins to speak to us and says, listen, Sunday mornings are fine, but that's not your identity marker as a Christian. You're not a Christian because you go to church, James would say. You're not living the Christian life. Going to church is really important. That's where you go to immerse yourself in the Word of God. That's where you go to experience forgiveness. That's where you go to receive directions and encouragement. That's where you go to be reminded of God's goodness. That's where you go to be recharged for re-entry into the world so that you can live the good life the life that God intended, and that's what's important. So much of James sounds like the words of Jesus, which may, again, being the brother connected to Jesus would make sense. You go and read Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five through eight, through seven, excuse me. You would hear a lot of the same things that you hear with James. Jesus, the central point of his teaching is telling us how we're supposed to live. And James picks that up. James would echo the words of Jesus when he says, why do you call me Lord, but then don't do what I say? If I'm truly Lord, then what I tell you to do, that's what you're supposed to do. And so James would echo that. 
he would dig right in and he would show us what that looks like. He ends his theology with the God is good statement, and then he begins to get into the meat of the matter. He says God's goodness has resulted in something called the new birth. You are new creatures. And then that being a new creature, you are, you've become the first fruits of God's creation. What James is saying there to us is, listen, God has been so good to us. He's given us a brand new life, a new birth, a new form of existing, a new beginning, a new entry into a new kind of life that has a new reality. And the purpose of that is so that you and I would live in such a way, James says, that we would somehow be a representative or this thing that people would look at and say, when I imagine heaven, now get this, when I imagine heaven or I imagine life after death with God, when I imagine that, when I think about what that is, when I see this group of people over here, that's what I picture. James says that this whole purpose, the whole thing of God's goodness is to bring about a new reality in our lives so that you and I might be the first fruits of the new creation. That we would be the examples, we would be the, the living signposts, as it were, to what heaven might look like down the road. We're actually living life as if heaven were now. Well, that's a pretty tall order. No problem doing that, right? You and I all, we all just live as though we're already experiencing heaven. We treat all the stuff that goes on in our lives with joy and with thanksgiving. We're, we're most forgiving of people. We're not impatient in any way with people. We drive our cars without cursing under our breath at those who are driving differently. We, we do all of these things with people who are somehow consumed with themselves that irritate us and we are just smiling examples of heaven on earth. James says, I know you're not. So here's what it looks like. New birth, new beginning to show the purposes of God in the life that's to come. And so he goes after two specific issues and they'll kind of form the themes of the next five weeks or so or four weeks after today what we look at. The first thing James goes after is the character of our speech. Not just how we talk, but what we say and what's behind it. Isn't that exciting? You ever say things that you just like, after it's out, you go, man, I wish I had like a, a suction thing that just went right back in. Wish I'd never said that. I had a whole day like that not too long ago. It was just one of those days, it was just, it was rough. I mean, it was rough. In fact, I came in here, and you wouldn't know, but I came in here on a Sunday morning still in the throes of all of that. I refused to say anything. I did not talk. I did not say a word. I refused to talk. Because every time I said something, it came out in a very, very poor way. I was, I was so out of sorts with all of it that when I finally did talk, this was from a Friday night to Sunday evening. So it was two full days of just silence other than what I had to say to you. Julie's loving that, by the way. <laughs> I sit down with Julie and I said, I wish I had that day to do over again. I would do it differently. Have you ever been there? I wish I had that situation to do over again because I would do it differently. And then I began to pour out my heart all the things that were going on on the inside. She was pretty gracious. She just said, had you been able just to say it that way in the very beginning, it probably could have been better. And she's right. The character of our speech, so important. And then James goes after the character of our actions. All of this is really relevant to me personally, 
because you hit seasons of your life where there are struggles and there are things going on. Well, back I had had some medical testing done and there was a gentleman in there who was assisting me with the uh, thing. And I did not want to be a part of this. I did not want to be a lab rat. I didn't want to be any of this. I actually was angry that I had to go through this. I was uh, upset with God. And so I took it out on him. That always helps me a great deal. And then I come to find out when I saw him again the next time that he knew me as a pastor. That made me feel really good. <laughs> I just couldn't bring myself to get to the place where I was supposed to be. Couldn't do it. There are others that say, well, that's not so bad. Just go ahead. And it's like, you don't understand. It is bad because I'm saying it's bad. And I want to make sure it's bad. You ever been there? James goes after speech, and he goes after actions. And he tells us, be quick to hear, be slow to speak, and be slow to anger. I think most of us live just the opposite. We're very slow to hear. We're very quick to speak. And we're even quicker to anger. James wants to tell us something this morning. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. I think the first thing he wants to tell us is about the art of listening. The art of listening. It's the exact opposite of our culture today. Wherein we, you know, we finally have arrived at this place where there is so much content and so many ways in which content is presented in our world that we can actually filter what we are listening to to listen to primarily what it is that agrees with us. We listen to only those who do agree with us. And we do that for the purpose of reinforcing what we already believe and rather than listening to those who are not like us or who may be opposed to us, to maybe learn a little bit why they're that way other than the fact that they're just wrong or they're just evil or they're just one of them, we don't listen that way. When was the last time that you actually listened? I mean listen to learn what someone who you disagree with had to say. I want to understand why you are different from me. I want to understand why you believe that. I want to understand why you think that or why you act that way. I don't like that. I don't approve of that, but I'd like to at least understand where are you coming from? Can we talk about it? That's not our world. Instead, I hear that which I don't like, and I rant and I rave about it to those who agree with me. It's become a toxic world because we've forgotten how to listen. James says everyone should be quick to hear. When was the last time you read something or studied something that you were opposed to in order to come to some understanding with it? One of the things I've had to do over the years because of my profession being someone who has to be, have significant convictions in what I preach is you have, a, you have a tendency or a danger to get entrenched in certain positions. And I realized that that was taking me down a path of intolerance towards others who didn't agree with me. And this may come as a shock to you, but most people don't agree with me. And so my world was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So I began this idea, I said, you know what, I'm going to begin reading those who write about scripture from a different perspective so that I can learn what it is that they believe. There were a whole bunch of people that were, had been put on the taboo list by those in the circles that I was in. You don't, they're, they're heretics, they're people out there that, so I began reading them. I began understanding that while we disagreed, there were some amazing concepts that they had that I needed to hear. 
And there was an amazing perspective that they brought that needed to have an impact on me because I don't know everything. I don't have all the correct belief. None of us do. James says, be quick to hear, open to hear, eager to hear. I've made it a point of my life to be a lifelong learner. I want to learn, I want to understand, I want to see what others are seeing that I don't see. People who you don't approve of, people who you look down at, or people on the other side of the political aisle from you, they aren't that way because they're bad people. They're not that way because somehow their thinking is all screwed up. They just are different. And if the scriptures tell us anything about the church, it's a place where difference somehow hang together. There is no, Jew, there is no Jew or Gentile. Those are different, but they hang together. There is no Greek or barbarian. Those are different. They hang together. There is no slave and master. Those two are totally different, but they hang out together. There's no male or female. Those two are totally different, but they hang out together. The church is a place where differing things come together and we need to be able to somehow listen to one another. Most of the time while things are being said, we have something that we're already thinking of to get back in so that we can win the argument. There are no arguments to win. Nobody ever wins an argument. There are only losers. There has to be a way in which we take what James is saying and being quick to hear and apply it to our lives. He says, be slow to speak. I call that the art of discussion or conversation. It's the exact opposite of our culture of verbal confrontationism. It's speaking in a way that's other than authoritative. Most of the time when people present something, they present it so hard and so firm that the only way that you could respond to it, if you can respond at all, is to somehow challenge that and then it escalates. Somehow there has to not only be the ability to hear, but the ability to dialogue. Sitting down across from my wife, she's not interested in hearing a lecture from me of all the things that she should be doing and we're going to do. She would invite me into a conversation that says, what do you think? And let's find some way to agree so that we can move forward. James says, let us be slow to speak. In my world, that's a sense of which people over the years have spouted scriptures to me to answer some questions. I recently was asked to serve on a jury. I was select juror number three selected to serve, but I was disqualified. I was hoping I could serve. I didn't have anything else to do that day. I thought just spending my day listening to arguments and then being a part of a group to make decisions would be well, it would be different, it would be better than mowing the lawn or, you know, whatever. It's interesting why I was kicked off the jury. The person who was being tried wore a, he re represented himself and wore a t-shirt with scripture plastered all over the back of the shirt. I'm thinking this is going to be interesting because he knows I'm a minister and that's how he chose to dress to go to court. But the reason I got kicked off is because he cited a scripture verse to me and asked me if I agreed with his interpretation of it. I didn't. I said, I didn't say, no, you're totally wrong. I said, well, I think there's other ways you could look at that. Well, would you agree? Well, it may say that, but I'm not convinced that's the whole thing. Three times. At the end of our third time, he says, you're out. It's kind of the way our world is. Don't agree, you're out. There was no way just to sit down and have a dialogue or a conversation. He'd already made up his mind. 
People have always done that. They spout some scripture as to what they believe and why everybody else is wrong. But then in doing that, there's all these other scriptures over here that somehow we ignore. In your world, it may be politics or it may be some opinion on people, their race or their, whether they're poor or they're uneducated or whatever. We make statements and those statements stake a claim to something rather than just dialogue and conversation. Be quick to hear, be slow to speak. James says, be slow to anger. I call that the art of controlling damaging emotions. Things get heated very quickly. Anger and hostility break out. Tribalism is rampant in our land and in our culture. Tribalism always pits us against them. There's always a rhetoric against them and there is always some sort of self-affirmation about ourselves. James says, don't, don't go there. Don't get heated up. Listen. So, slowly speak, back it down. For some people that's really hard because they're very, very passionate in their personality. They're very, very forceful. Others, it's not quite so hard. But it is interesting that as James just says those three simple little things, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, he is incorporating our world as we know it. Isn't that interesting? And how easy it is to go in those directions, James says, no, 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 no. Well, what's the alternative, James? He says, ah, now that we're having a dialogue and you ask that question, he says, receive with meekness the word that gets engrafted into your soul that's able to transform you and reshape you and restructure you. Be someone who is eager just to hear the words of God. Let Jesus continually tell us what to do. Let God continually speak the words into our hearts and into our minds. And in so doing, we begin to transform and retrain how we think and how we act. James says, that's your solution. When you receive the engrafted word, it changes you. It brings about salvation, a transformation of who you are. He says, but listen, that means this, you can't only be a hearer of it, you must be a doer as well. It's not enough just to hear, but there is some sort of action that is required on the back end of that. What does that look like? Well, James tells us. This is true and undefiled religion that you bridle your tongue. He'll come back to that. We'll have a whole week on that. That'll be fun. Visit orphans and widows. The idea is not just those two categories, but it has to do with social justice, visiting those who are vulnerable, those who are poor, those who are struggling. Open hospitality, openness with your life towards them and keeping yourself unstained from the world, which has to do with moral imperatives, how we live our lives and the, 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 the moral aspect of how we live. James says that's what true religion looks like. That is the goal that we are to chase after. James says a lot to us in these verses speaks to our world most graphically, speaks to my life most poignantly. James says there's a different way to live. I challenge you this week, go home, read the first chapter of James over 
and over and over again. Take what he says. Take notes on it. And say, God, how am I doing? Help me in what I'm not doing. That I might live the life that shows others what heaven might look like down the road. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for words of scripture. Thank you for words that were spoken by someone who saw the church and says we must become better. Help us to see we're not in this alone. It is a people problem and we are people. So we thank you for this word. We pray now the grace to believe what we've heard and the grace to live in ways that please and honor you with the result of it. In Jesus' name, amen. confession of our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, Jeff and Carol, if you'll wait on us, will receive our offering.
Join me in our prayer for the offering. God of wonder, we offer you these humble gifts, signs of your goodness and mercy. Receive them with our gratitude and use them to further the purposes of your kingdom, both in our community and throughout the world. Amen. You may be seated. In our prayer time this morning, we will lift up those who are dear to us, those who we know are struggling with uh, certain needs. I re uh, refer you in the bulletin to the prayer list. A uh, good close friend of mine, Reverend Barry Sweet from the Bryan Presbyterian Church, uh, had very, very major significant surgery this last week and is still recovering in the hospital. So um, he will be uh, really uh, outside of the ministry for a couple of months here. So that is why he is on the list. You may not know him, but I believe as part of our larger church family, he should certainly be in our prayers. So as we go through that time in our prayers, as we come to the place where we invite you to bring those who are close to you to the Lord, we'll have a time of silence and there you can present those people. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for reminding us that faith is more than just a system of belief. It is a way to live. It is a way to live that would bring about a whole new world. Help us to be that people. As we look at our world, we are so mindful that our world does not live in the way that you intended. We pray, Father, for that which is broken for the strife, for the war, for the conflicts, for the abuses, all of those things that take place in which people are tragically hurt, tragically harmed, people are oppressed, people who are exploited, people who are used for purposes other than the place of which they exist within the image of God. We pray for those who have suffered hardship through natural consequences, those who have lost homes to wildfires, those who have suffered at the hands of earthquakes, those who have experienced flooding and mudslides, those who have experienced the tr trauma and the drama of life. We pray this morning for our nation. We pray for its leaders that they might be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. Father, we pray for those in our communities in which we live, lives among whom we live, we might show them a better way. Help us to be neighbors. Help us to be those who care. Help us to be those who involve ourselves in the lives of others in order to make a difference. We are especially mindful today of those who exist around us in our world, in our families, our friends, our neighbors who are struggling. We lift them now before you. As we do this, we are mindful that you are a good God. You give good and perfect gifts. That your grace, your power to heal, your love, your mercy, your ability to grant peace that is beyond anything we can imagine prevails in our lives. So touch these we have raised before you. Move into their lives through your spirit. Touch them with your grace heal them with your mercy, surround them with your love. Father, we thank you for these things. All of these things we lift before you in full assurance and confidence because we pray them in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. you. May the Lord our God bless you and keep you. May the Lord our God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. May we be a people who are quick to hear, slow to speak, and even slower to anger. Go in peace for we are. Amen. Amen.